this tale is, as all bard songs are, an adaptation. It may contain adult themes and strong language. Welcome, dear listeners, to Abyss. Welcome to episode 20 of Abyss, the epilogue episode. So, who are you? What are you? And to celebrate National Sneak Some Zucchini Into Your Neighbor's Porch Day, which is apparently a thing, fuck knows how, how would you sneak some zucchini onto your neighbor's porch? Starting with Shiraz. Hello, my name is Shiraz, and I play the Dragonborn Rogue Isidore, who eats things and does science, and is now free. I'm going to cut everyone off at the past and say that this is some fucking euphemism level shit, you know, when they're going on, and I'm not going to address it. So I think I would just ring my neighbor's doorbell and then chuck the zucchini onto the pot. It says sneak some zucchini into your neighbor's porch day. Offers gardeners a variety of ways to rid themselves of extra produce. <laughs> so uh, I don't like zucchini, so I would definitely like ring the doorbell and then just run around the back and chuck everything onto their back porch. Fair enough. Then. Well, Wednesday. Hi, I'm Wednesday, and I play Layla the Tiefling. So I survived, and we're not entirely traumatized by the underdog so I think I'm still pretty much myself. How would I sneak zucchini into my neighbor's, well onto my neighbor's porch? Into the porch? Into the porch into for some reason, which I don't really understand. Which yeah. is why I was saying it's a euphemism. I'm not sure it's onto. In any case, I really despise my neighbors. They <laughs> throw these crazy loud parties where I can feel the bass in the floor of my whole house and then they tell me that it's not them but if I open my curtains, I can see the fucking disco lights. So, I would literally just wait for all the zucchinis to go off and then chuck them over the wall into their swimming pool. Yes, Fair enough. Then. that's what I would do. Okay. If anyone interested, this does have the longest hashtag I've ever seen of a one. Wow, that's crazy. Why is uh, it into your neighbor's... I don't know. Like, what? It must it's be like, in your window. Inside. It has to be in your end. Okay. I'm going to have to Twitter this. <laughs> <laughs> Tono. Hi, I'm Tono, and I play Rast of the Coast, the expatriate, impoverished human noble warrior who, while he may not have acted like it, being stuck in the Underdark was sort of an adventure. He enjoyed the purpose it gave him, so now that they're free, he must find a new one, even though he didn't nearly have his arm bitten off by a feral goblin he thought was his friend. She said and sorry. <laughs> yeah, she did. And given that I live in a dorm, I don't really have neighbours, and if you count my dorm mates, they don't really have porches either. <laughs> so I guess the nearest thing I could do was just leave a zucchini I bought on their shelf in the fridge. Does that count? I mean, it's I, in I, the I fridge. I suppose so, it would be sneaking. It would be inside the location. <laughs> In, um... I mean, you could always put it in their bed, but that would only <laughs> add to the euphemism problem. To your neighbor's porch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, the thing is, like, you're saying you don't have any neighbors, and one of your most famous neighbors throughout this entire game has been the one with the laugh. Oh yeah, he, he's moved out, sadly. 
Yeah, so but, you need to like uh, track him down and find out if he has a port. <laughs> He's got an port. <laughs> I think he lives in an apartment, so I doubt it. Maybe could throw one up on a balcony. <laughs> Just a very well aimed zucchini. So Twitter has been disappointing because there's nobody celebrating the day we're well, talking. At first, about. it doesn't exist till tomorrow. So. <laughs> okay. Well, it says it, exists. it has, ex- has a previous experience, but yeah, it's very weird. So. We go now to Dragon. Hello, I'm Dragon. I am playing Tris Nitra, a drow who has adopted Stol and made friends with a werewolf. My neighbours don't have porches either because we are not in America. I'm in Glasgow (laughs) and most of the housing here (laughs) in the form of Victorian tenements. So about the closest to it I could get would probably be putting some courgettes through the letterbox of the <laughs> other people in my clothes. I think this is an endo because that's like even worse. Well, pretty much every close I've ever been into in Glasgow, the stairwells for the different buildings, everyone has an inner door and a storm door. So you've got this tiny little space between your two doors, which would be the equivalent to a porch. So if I can push them through the external letterbox so it's in between those two doors, that should count. In Glasgow, what would people do if you actually pushed zucchini through all their letterboxes in a close? They'd try it. They'd probably use them and then be slightly concerned about which of their neighbours was an absolute fucking nutcase. Probably, yeah. So, I mean, would you... It's uh, probably in much worse language than that. Would you use a courgette that had been posted through a letterbox by some random? No. Probably. I mean, to be honest, wouldn't they have to, like, cut it up to be posting it through? Yeah, uh, they could just shunt it through, I imagine. <laughs> I did oh, find something on Instagram. Oh. So, unexplicably, there's a picture of a cat pushing, like, a drawing of a cat pushing a zucchini onto your face, like, towards us. And there's a picture of a model, and someone has said fire and put the fire emoji. I see. I wish I was making it up. <laughs> what? I wish you were too. <laughs> that's very confusing. Are you sure that's not just a stock photo someone's using? Possibly. It does look like a see, stock photo. I can see some kind of watermark on it, but I don't understand. It has nothing to do with zucchini. zucchinis or neighbors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Susie. Oh, yeah, I am Susie Q. I play 13, the ancient one. She has remained the ancient one. I started up a business and I am also in the problem of I live in flats. There are no porches. We don't even have storm doors. But if I lived in a place where I had a porch and my neighbor had a porch, I was going to sneak courgettes into their porch. I would sneak out in the den night one time and plant courgettes underneath their porch and then tend them in secret while they grew into their porch. So they'd be like total surprise, and then they'd be like, "Oh no, where did those courgettes come from?" <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely the definition of sneaking them in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> now we're on to the epilogue parts. Does anyone wish to go first and tell us what happened to your character after the finished being in the abyss? Most of the first bit is like, I just went and got my stuff back that was probably pawned off by all the drow that were, you know, mm-hmm. taking us away as slaves. Yep. And I found all my stuff, and in the process, I also tried to figure out who Seraglio was, and if I can find him to return the favor. But then I got tired of searching, and I came back, and I suggested that 13 name her shop Soup and Sundry. Mm-hmm. And, and she gladly accepted that. So, so you I'm can currently. Tell us what you ate along the way during this epilogue. Like... It would take a Nailing. long, it would take <laughs> a long, long time. Obviously, there were some zucchini involved. <laughs> some zucchini-related problems. <laughs> Zucchini-adjacent recipes were made, but like, most of it was just like Lord of the Rings. A lot of walking, a lot of talking. Fair uh-huh. enough. Fair enough. Should we we move to Soup and Sundry then, so that it follows? Shall we hear from the other half of Soup and Sundry and see how they got on? Well, you see, Soup and Sundry started off as a fairly solo adventure for our dear 13, who went off to go spend time with her people, the Minotaurs, maybe bumped into them in the labyrinth. But anyway, she has now set up a shop, stocked with the many things she's found in her adventures, 
and the Minotaurs occupy themselves by going off and fighting adventurers that go into the labyrinth and 13 sells them soup and possibly helpful items. And she did call it Ye Ancient Shoppy because she thought it would have more viability if people had believed they'd been there a really long time. Mm. But when Ishidoro came along and pointed out soup and sundries, you know, telling people what you sold would help, she did that. And she makes good most, soup. What's the most expensive item on the menu? On the soup menu? Mm. Or the item menu? Well, the most expensive item on her list would probably be the two teeth, the two drow teeth that she oh, got yeah. in the first session because they've got magical powers. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're like 7,000 gold pieces each. Um, <laughs> the soup is available at a much more reasonable price of five silver pieces. And the soup is whatever soup I've made today, which is variable. Ah, okay. So is 13 happy just making soup for everyone every day? Yeah. I mean, she's probably maybe starting to run out of stock. I don't know how busy the labyrinth is with adventurers going in trying to kill minotaurs, but it's a living. <laughs> He's her own boss, which was her ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and want to go next, or should we choose someone? I can go. Okay, so what happened to Layla? So, Layla just wanted to forget about this. Throughout it all, demons were like severely misunderstood and bad-mouthed. <laughs> In any case, so although she wanted to forget about everything, she couldn't get rid of the sword because occasionally, you know, you need someone to talk to. And she'd also developed a strange attachment to Rastikas because he's possibly the only person she's ever met who is as physically strong as she is. Also that time... Yeah, also that time he didn't die when she hit him with a spade, so... Like, he's the only person who didn't die when she hit him with the spade. That's something special, man. So, <laughs> so she's taken to just following him around on adventures and occasionally trying not to kill people with that marble shovel. But yeah, that's Layla. Oh, I would like to say we're not poor. We did have get a lot of gold. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I'll give it to him because he's noble, isn't he? Doesn't he need a lot of gold? I don't know. Don't rich people have gold? I think most went <laughs> to pay for the stock of soup and sundry, but okay. <laughs> so, uh, let's hear from Rastikos. What did Rastikos do? Well, if Layla offers her company, they will travel together and go on smaller adventures and the like. And with Layla there to maybe rein in his worst tendencies, Rastikos would likely not get into too much trouble as it's sort of getting pulled into the Underdark did give him an, something to do. He had, at least in my head canon of it, been walking, traveling for a few years as, I mean, I've been introducing him as a noble every episode, and I've been trying to remember mentioning that it's an impoverished noble house. It's basically only noble in name, and that's sort of why he's been traveling, and he doesn't really have the raw ambition to try and build something new. So he would probably be the first to sort of leave the group behind post Underdark. But if, again, Layla offers a company that would maybe even draw him back, maybe he would visit Soup and Sundry from time to time, reminisce. I think when stock was running low, 13 would be like, hey, can we come on an adventure with you? Because I need to stop. And like, she would just <laughs> loot everything behind him. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's so much an offer of my company. It's more like... 13 is going along with you. Because because Layla is so, like, fucking shy and can't figure out how to get back to, like, normal life after this whole thing that happened. She's just Mm. like, oh, I formed an unhealthy attachment to someone that I didn't kill. Okay, good. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Just continues not to kill him. Yeah. (laughs) Let's continue testing this theory until it... Is this what a friend is? (laughs) Oh, for Layla. Absolutely. I don't think Rastakas would realize it, but he does also enjoy the company. I mean, in my original thinking in this past week, I had imagined that Rastakas would either, in option A, end up way over his head and die or get injured in some manner, or get over his head, but not so much that he would be incapacitated, but enough to draw him down a darker path. I do think it's worth mentioning that, I don't know if this happened in the weeks I weren't here, 
But I believe Rastagos was the only one to stop and actually listen to the demon gems and be slightly tempted by the pride gem offering him power. Uh, yep. There was yep. something there that he might have given into were he on his own. Were it weren't for that fateful shuttle. To the back of the head. <laughs> Sorry. It worked out for the best. I think it's like Layla with this. But I did do it on purpose. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why Layla needs to stay with him. To hit him on the back of the head at just exactly the right moment. When he stood there looking over that precipice into the dark side, <laughs> she needs to come up to back him well, away. I, I, I feel, I feel that. I feel that Rastikos, and I don't know, I'm assuming this, but he may have developed a sort of begrudging like of company rather than traveling alone after spending a harrowing experience fighting demons in the Underdark. Yeah, he has accepted the presence of equals rather than underlings, as he might have been used to in the waning days of his family's house. I imagine being a slave would have been a, a bit of a harrowing experience for him as well. Also, that hammer has to be some kind of magical. But that's it's not awesome something I can with. answer. Yeah, at this point, it must. Those demon gems cannot have cleanly broken. It might be an evil hammer at this point now that I think about it. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, only Nikolai can really draw the line with the hammer. <laughs> TBD. TBD, yes. Well, finally. What became of Tris Stool and the Were Rat? So, Tris's television show. Sorry. <laughs> Tris's first priority was to get out of the sun, essentially. And as the Maikunid village was the most similar to the Underdark, they first traveled there. The Maikunids were very hospitable. Stool had zero interest in staying with them. Sidia suggested that perhaps the dwarves would be the best people to help, given the need for them to have protection from the sun, because the Myconids would suffer badly in the sun as well. So, wrapping ourselves up in cloth, travelled, saw the dwarves, and they were like, hmm, hmm. How about a nice cloak that has a big hood so that you can bring it over and cover your eyes from the sun? Okay, that's a good start. I'm good with that. And for stool, we crafted a broad-brimmed hat that is brimless on one side so that it doesn't keep jagging into me as he's in the sling. Although, of course, we're in less of a rush now, so he can run around as much as he wants. We also sourced for him a lightweight and pale-coloured tunic in a similar colour to his body, but just enough to give them a little bit of physical protection from the sunlight. The were-rat, however, point-blank refuses anything that might help. He will not have a hat and he will not have a visor to keep the sun out of his eyes. He won't put it on and it's ripped off in about three seconds. So now that they can all travel relatively safely, the were-rat's just gonna need to get used to it. Triss has realised that what she really needs is she needs a way to help disguise that she's drow. So she has these tattoos in her skin that came there with the magic that she accidentally absorbed. So she goes back to the Myconids first and is looking for some sort of plant dyes that she can then put into the tattoos in the hope that she can then change the colour of them because that would mean that she could, you know, try and make herself look more like an above ground elf. Maybe like a dusk elf rather than drow. But essentially at this point, they do not have a set plan. Trace would feel happier if she had someone to help her learn how to control the magic. So she's currently been going around and slowly gathering up all of the things that she needs to be able to travel safely in future. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is Stool still like super high all the time? Yes. Very happy and just claps all the time. I think that's okay. the trauma we inflicted. Uh, I think that no, I thought it was because he was a mushroom. So, you know. <laughs> all of I thought totally he was suggest. weird when we first encountered him. He just continued to be weird throughout. Layla does not ask yeah. questions, to which she does <laughs> not wish to know the answer. 
but he was very instrumental and i suppose like people up here aren't like accustomed to things talking in their heads so it's always a great kind of an icebreaker to shout inside yeah. someone's head <laughs> they play so many pranks on people I think when they're drunk. Like, yeah like just plant the idea like say hey Stu, tell that guy his butt's itchy and then just watch it unfold <laughs> this reminds me of a story when i was in school there were a lot of kids who were like all sorts of great but there was one in the second grade he was this tiny guy and he swore like crazy like he swore up and down because his dad swore and we used to call him machine gun because you could point him towards anyone and he'd call them a motherfucker and it's hilarious oh my god so we just unleash him during parent teacher meetings and we'd be like go inside that room and call the first adult you see motherfucker <laughs> wow oh that's amazing yeah that's what 13 would do still with parties <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like how many years are we talking this epilogue has gone on? Because if it's like years, 13 would totally have like a yearly party where she would send everybody in. It was literally meant to be a couple of weeks. It was meant to it's be a, a sort of like six, time. I think if we said like sort of six months, so we'll say six months to a year at this point. Hmm. I think it's also the case that most of us would kind of, at least I know Ishidoro would, I would use Soup and Sundry as like kind of my way to keep in touch with everybody. Mm-hmm. If they all kind of like touch base, I would like routinely visit back just to check up on Thirteen and Ish- give her um, shinies. Give her shinies, obviously, that come with gift. But the idea is that Ishidor has always been hunting demons, and now that he has the other purpose of trying to find these drow that like put them under, he's slowly been working towards that over the time that he's been spending out. But most of it would be like he'd come back every month or so and just check up on everybody and how they were doing. You know, nothing brings people together like shared trauma. <laughs> and soup. And soup. <laughs> and soup. <laughs> nice. Not that Layla's going to eat that soup because she doesn't know what's in it. Zucchini. Sure. Oh, if she was really fussy <laughs> with it. I mean, like, to be fair, like, most of the soup would probably be pretty obvious, like, carrot. Because she's not got a blender, has she? So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Chunks. <laughs> Like, oh, what's this? We, oh, a boot. Okay, good. We, we only have chunky soup. <laughs> it would be like carrots and <sighs> tails. Going by the earlier discussion, would 13 have invented a grater? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she totally invented the grater. It was probably used as some sort of torture instrument, to be fair, by her former yeah. master. So. Probably. And then she's like, oh, I have a new use for this one. Well, if you made a thin soup, then maybe still could actually eat a little bit of it oh, once it had cooled mm. down. As soon as she it was would cold, like have specialist eat. soup, <gasps> she'd like make special soups for her friends. Like Layla's would be really spicy. Oh, like yeah, on <laughs> and <the> fire. <laughs> Asticos would be like French onion soup or something. Because that's like no, but could you literally <laughs> set it on fire? Like, could you <laughs> actually <laughs> set the soup on fire? Because that would be ideal. Yeah, she'd like put a layer of like 100% roof <laughs> rum or something on top and drop a mat. I, I, I have a question. How is 13th status as the ancient one in, your, in this time? Like, have the Minotaurs not started questioning things? Or <laughs> are they just like. Are they I suppose like, that's really something that's up to the DM. I think the yeah. Minotaurs have kind of been taken to a new world by the Ancient Ones, so they're just kind of like, well, this is our new world now. Yeah, and like the Labyrinth sort of came up near the sort of portal they all came through from the other place, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So the she would like had... essentially kind of, yeah, be like, now we are guarding this gate as well as your Labyrinth. And, you know, like she would be really friendly towards adventures as well, because her whole gig would be like, here's some soup rations, and da da da, right in you go, watch out for the Minotaurs. And then they would never come out again. And eventually <laughs> she would go back in, get their stuff. I mean, terrible, it. terrible for repeat customers, but like, you know, solid adds, business. Adds to the mystery, you know. <laughs> And, you know, repeat customers are usually, like, maybe one person left in a party, so they go away and get another party and come back for a... Yeah. <laughs> it's a solid business model I in just, the adventuring just, world. I just imagine them, like, coming out battered and you have, like, a bowl of soup ready for them. You know, but they're there, it's okay. Go get another bunch of Minotaurs, simple... I mean, say, I never would have thought Minotaurs <laughs> would have been in a labyrinth. Have some soup. 
I would invest in this business. Like, <laughs> should door open. Like, <laughs> should door open. Be like, so you say you have a foolproof plan? Here's like some money. <laughs> I think <laughs> like, Reese would approve of it quite a lot as well. It's very I, sneaky. Yeah, and I think eventually over time she would get good enough at like soup making to make like soup that when you drink it gives you like plus one strength for like an hour or whatever. Ones that like store HP and shit like that. So. Healing soup. That's who she'd be. She was an NPC, then she's had her adventure, and now she's gone back to being a weird NPC. <laughs> she's that goblin stall that you need to stock up on health potions just before you go in to fight the Minotaur Labyrinth. <laughs> the one that makes no sense. Like, I was discussing this with Dizzy, but like, we've saved Cleave. So, we have saved Cleave, yes. And I'm yeah. pretty sure 13 would have given him useful employment. Anything oh yeah, she would teach him how to make soup. <laughs> Start a franchise. Set him up outside the Mykonid village or something. I mean, we don't actually know what other threat came from. decided what happened to Gazrum. I thought he went yeah. back with the rest of he the dwarves. Back with yeah. the dwarves. I don't know. Is he now so used he to us? That he wasn't there with us when we arrived above ground. So, I mean, I've been back to the dwarf city. I'm sure I would have checked in with him and see how he was doing. I mean, I would have taken him along on like a trip just to make a whole time thing. Because him and I like had a good raffle. Alright. And he's somewhat of a bard, right? So I'd yes, like he's... totally imply that I could write my tales. So yes, I guess that will do for the epilogues. As of next week, we'll be doing a couple of breakdowns of the previous episodes. So we'll start at like the beginning and talk about the story and talk about your thoughts. again next week for more of our tale. This podcast is an adaptation of Out of the Abyss, a 5th edition D&D adventure. It was adapted from the original story by Nikolai Pupsky. The podcast features Nikolai, Dragon, Shiraz, Freya, Susie Q, Torno and Wednesday Le Fay. All music was written and performed by Daniel Bustrom. Artwork was by John Moore. And if you, dear listener, wish to acquire your own sets of finest metal or acrylic adventuring dice, then journey through the Underdark to dndice.co.uk and speak the name Penance RPG at the checkout for a 5% discount off your order. Farewell and Godspeed, for we fear the madness is closing in. Good night out there, whatever you are. Ha 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 ha.